It is anything. It is everything. It is the Buck Gritano Podcast. Ancient alien theory. Ancient civilization. Spirituality. Mythology. Reality TV. Reality TV star. Current events. Not so current events. Comedy. Religion. Music. Authors. Sports. If it's hot and if it's happening, it's right here, right now, on the Buck Gritano Podcast. And now, here's the man who makes stream of mind a streaming sensation, Buck Gritano. Welcome everybody to the Buck Rotano Podcast And that's how it goes I knew it, I knew it, I knew it There's not a week that goes by That I start up a show With this blog talk radio And it doesn't play the intro I wanted to play But anyway, the Buck Rotano Podcast Brought to you by Big Apple Elevator Service We'll get into that. I have, I'm going to plug them. I get to get, say hello first. Thank you, first of all, uh, to Mooney Hanning, Joseph, longtime buddy, picking up a sponsorship with the program. That's showing support, and I appreciate that. We'll get back into that. I have a right. Uh, I have a live read. But first of all, we got a special guest, right? A guy that, when I was a kid, growing up in Rockaway Beach, I used to run patents, and I'd be the wide receiver. I wasn't Kurt Sohn. I wasn't Al Toon. I was Wesley Walker. So I just like to go deep. And I, every week I would see Wesley catch a touchdown pass for over 50 yards. Oh, man. Just missed. I just missed the beginning of his career because I was, I was born in 75. He started in 77. But let's welcome him in. Uh, this is the new wave of podcast. And it's funny. Let's bring you on. Hold on a second. Thank you for coming on, Wesley. I appreciate it. You're in the, 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 the ring of honor at, with the Jets. You, you, your numbers, your numbers lie a, a bit, man. Your career numbers definitely lie because your injuries and, and, and throughout the career, throughout your career, Wesley. Well, welcome you first of all. Thank you for joining the Buck Rotano podcast. How you doing, brother? I'm doing just fine, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. And you just mentioned two guys, Al Toon, and you mentioned Kurt Zone, and a lot of people don't even realize he was just an unsung hero. And I can remember I had one of my best games. And I was missed the, the week of practice because of the strain going, growing that I had. And he had to fill in for me in practice. I come back and have one of my best games, and I get all the accolades. But uh, I remember addressing that issue, and it's guys like that that don't get enough credit. And you mentioned Al Toon was great in his own right, but I that's what I really miss. If I miss anything about the NFL, it's the relationships and the friendships that you developed over the years. Used to run back the punts and uh, reliable hands too, right? What hands? Didn't didn't really. Yeah. Wasn't gonna, he wasn't going to break nothing. Trust me, he wasn't going to break nothing long distance. He had a, a couple of nice returns in his career, but he was that solid uh, three or four wide receiver. But forget about Kurt Stone. We, I loved. I mean, Tune Stone, but it was you, man. You went deep on that team. You like the unsung hero on that Jets team through through the eighties. Uh, when when a big play had to be made, you came up huge. Uh, I know you fought uh, injuries throughout your whole career. Your biggest game, Miami versus the Dolphins, uh, that was at Meadowlands. We're going to get into that later, but four touchdowns, uh, 194 yards. What an amazing day. What a back and forth. Ken O'Brien picked what, what it was, 85, late in the first round, and Marino was on board, and that was the big controversy. Uh, what, what, what was – forget about – before we get into yourself, what was your take on Ken O'Brien as a, as a quarterback? I know not as a person. I love – I absolutely adore Kenny O'Brien, and I look at, uh, you know, the personalities, the, the, the relationship you develop with a person, but I got a firsthand knowledge of what he could do, and we had a special relationship, and I had some great quarterbacks, and I don't, and I used to uh, have to apologize to Richard Todd because I'd always build up Kenny O'Brien. I loved any quarterback that threw me the ball, and it's your teammates, you know, but I had a special relationship with Kenny O'Brien, and and I always said, I'll take Kenny O'Brien. I don't care if it was Joe Namath. I never had an opportunity to play with Joe Namath. And he, I just saw him last night. Wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, I loved him to death. But I would take Kenny O'Brien over Dan Marino or John Elway. And that's the way I felt about this guy. And I remember seeing him in a Superstars competition where he beat both those guys. And he could compete with anybody. The unfortunate part with the Jets and a lot of us when you – Think about guys like Joe Glecko, Margasso, myself, uh, some of the athletes that we did have. We could play with anyone, but we didn't have enough of those guys uh, to be able to, to put together championships and to be consistent uh, performers with winning. And that's the difference when you look at a Pittsburgh or New England who is consistent with winning all the time. And 
and you look at San Francisco, they had virtual uh, all pros at every position. We had a couple of guys that uh, that could play on that level, but not enough of it. And then you had to battle with injuries, and uh, not just myself, but the guys that I just mentioned also. And uh, but I also felt that we could play with anybody, and if, and if we would have been, let's say, more uh, consistent with winning and staying healthy, hey, a lot of us probably be in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> One guy should definitely be in the Hall of Fame, and that's uh, Joe Klecko. Absolutely, stud Absolutely. positions. That, that's a joke. I, is it is it because the Jets are such? Um, I don't want to say it franchise. I'm a long time Jet fan. I've been a Jet fan my whole life. Forty two years old. You guys uh seeing you guys go up against uh New England, Miami, uh, you know, growing up in them days in the eighties, I, I just fell in love with the Jets. A Giants, I I don't know if the Giants were well, I can I'm gonna to touch on the Giants. Why are we wearing a Giants hat on the internet? I, I got bad at that. I looked up oh my gosh, Herschel, you were wearing a, a, a giant hat. But th- like, that's besides the point. Is it is it is it that um we're so disrespected in the NFL that Joe Klecko is over. Um, you know, people just just look over him. As well, a player. I don't know if it's about. I don't know if it's disrespected. It's just the politics of the game. I don't know who goes about really voting. Uh, you know, and who has the actual count. Uh, a lot of these guys really don't know uh, what uh, uh, individual even put forth in the organization or, or, or what your attributes were. Uh, I don't think in, in my case, when I look at certain things, I don't know if people really knew what you really brought to the table. So I look at that and uh, I know the players that you played against, they would know that or the players that you practice against. And unfortunately we can't make that decision. So the decision making on that level, uh, a lot of times it's caught up in the fact that you won championships, you've stayed healthy and you put up the numbers, uh, but that didn't necessarily make you a hall of famer. I've had guys that, uh, that are in the Hall of Fame that uh, I they were my backups in the Pro Bowl or or I, I you know I consistently were better than them in college or whatever uh, so I look at things like that but it's unfortunate that uh, you know whether it's winning and and getting the publicity and the accolades that you, you didn't get that could put you over the top with that and uh, I can only guess at certain things but. The politics of it, I couldn't really answer it, uh, and, and, and certainly with what Joe Glucko brought to the table, uh, he certainly deserves that in his own right. But then you have certain incidents that happen off the field that may affect it, just like Mark Gassano, uh, that, uh And I look at a guy like Terrell Owens and some of the other players who came in with this flamboyancy or just the, the way about him that turned a lot of the uh, uh, media off, and that could hurt you also. But some of the things uh, that go on in this league, I have no idea how they go about making their decision. This league, and, and it's funny you say you have no idea, but you're a teammate through thick and thin, even 20-something years after retirement. I, I just love your quote. I just love what, I just love your opinion, to be honest. Which you, you go back now, 1977, you're drafted by the New York Jets, a kid out of California, Carson High School in California. You went to Cal University. I know you had some knee injuries because I saw you on – I think it was 19, uh, 2012, you did the second-round draft pick for the Jets. I think it was uh, Sean Hill. Oh, man, I don't even want to say the names. Jeff Stephen, Hill. Stephen Hill. Stephen Hill. Stephen, Stephen Hill. Hill. And you said about yep. there was no car, car, carbines or no workouts before. Uh, the Jets drafted you. Didn't, they didn't know you were blind? In one eye, that's that's absolutely yeah, amazing. Yeah, and, and, and that's, and that's um, um, I remember one of the, um, uh, we had a president, uh, Jim Kenzel and his son, uh, Mike Kenzel, worked for the Jets, and he was like their traveling secretary. And I remember him telling us, you know, you're the reason, uh, or at least one of the reasons, the combines had gotten started. And uh, when they drafted me, I had a uh, very serious knee injury in my senior year, and it cost me being a number one draft choice. As a matter of fact, the Jets had said they were going to pick me in the first round until I hurt my knee. And I actually got a call from New Orleans uh, when they started the second round, and I was excited because one of my buddies, uh, Chuck Muncy, had just been drafted there before. So I, I was looking forward to, you know, uh, reuniting with him and then the Jets call. And um, and I know they had flew out the trainer to look at my knee and everything else, and I had a lot of concern. But I was supposed to still be a first-round draft choice, but I slipped to the second. And I was happy that I got drafted by the Jets. But when we came in from physicals, 
uh, they really didn't do the type of physicals, uh, you know, other than maybe sending a trainer out uh, for injuries that you had. And matter of fact, they drafted a, a five-time All-Pro, Marvin Powell, who I wish I could find to stay, who is just a, a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. He was my best man, and nobody knows how to get a hold of this guy. He was a five-time All-Pro. What he had loose knees, and so um, uh, Leon Hess got the word. Uh, uh, you know, when I had to read it, I chart because I really I kept it hit all throughout my career. My mom was always afraid that I was going to get injured uh, and get hit in my other eye. I played baseball, played all sports, but I always kept it hit. And I never had to read an eye chart until I got to the Jets, and I actually lied to him and said I could see the Big E. Everybody remembers the Big E on the eye chart, but I really couldn't see it. And so I said, you know, I'm, I have a cataract that I was born with. I'm blind. And so the owner of the floor, Leon Hess, I never forget that he, he said, I just uh, drafted a number one tackle with loose knees, and I got a receiver with a bad <laughs> knee and blind on top of it, you know. So the Jets started getting together with uh, 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 doing pre-physicals. Then they got together with other teams to do pre-physicals. And the uh, other teams started doing that. And that's how they kind of by actually kind of got started because of the injuries that uh, that may occur before. And uh, and that's a true story. And it's funny because when I used to run the patterns, and, and every, every every kid knew growing up being Jet fans that you had you were blind in one eye. So that, that was the amazing part that it even made you more special but I guess on the flip side, it is you were just so used to it. I mean, me seeing with two eyes, you see with yeah. one, I guess, right? Yeah, I, I you know, and everybody always asks me that. I've had an uh, ophthalmologist because uh, I, you know, I got tested where I have no depth perception. And, you know, sometimes I remember Lamb Jones would be in the car and, you know, I'd be changing lanes and everybody's looking over the face. <laughs> sure you know, the traffic is good. And uh, uh, I can't explain it, but I'd have to, I, you know, number one, thank God for ability, uh, but you have to work hard at what you're doing. I've been able to be an inspiration to people that have uh, handicaps and that if you're willing to put the time in, and uh, and I think the fact that I was born with it and, and making the adjustment, but I also have uh, aware of objects where I have peripheral, uh, peripheral vision, even though I can't see out of the eye. It's the weirdest thing, and I can't explain it, and I've had doctors come look at me and trying to figure this out because they, they can't figure out how I could catch the ball, but as a receiver, you have to work on the little things. And I just remember my first year with a guy by the name of Dan Henning. He actually taught me how to run right. So I could run by it just with ease. And But I learned how to run patterns where I could even make it even easier. And with the speed and running routes and uh, the quickness that I had, uh, and I could line up anywhere on the field, run the same pattern and give you a different look and you would never know what direction I was going in. And uh, Dan Henning brought me to another level that I couldn't even imagine because I was used to just going, just running up on guys and just running boom by them. And sometimes I could just do that. But he taught me how to really run routes. And then I prided myself in being able to catch with my hands, which a lot of receivers, and, and I was a track runner. And a lot of track runners, they uh, – um, and I, I always said I was a football player running that ran track, but uh, the, you can always come with a, a stigma with speed that you couldn't catch the ball. So I prided myself with that, uh, being able to catch the ball and being able to run patterns on top of that. And I hated being just a deep threat because I felt I could run patterns. I could do short or deep. But, you know, there there's another thing with systems or, or how coaches will label you. And those are things you don't have control over when you're dealing with a team sport or what a coach or – uh, somebody thinks about you. And I, I really got annoyed at Joe Walton because I tried to say, you know, to him, don't base your opinion on somebody else and what they may think. Get to know the player first and, and then make your assessment. Uh, but deep threat, how fast did you run a 440 coming out of college? What was your what was your 40 yard? Uh, you know, I've been clocked even in high school, like at 4'2", but when I came with the Jets, uh, and I remember one year, uh, Lamb Jones and myself uh, were clocked at 435 together, you know. Wow. And wow. everybody else said, who's faster? And I said, until you line us both up, you won't find out. You know. And Lamb Jones is one of the best receivers I've ever seen. But here's a guy that had all the talent, didn't uh, have confidence in himself, didn't have a coach like I had. I, Dan Henney, I remember telling me, because I had my drops my rookie season, and he said, you're going to catch more than you're going to drop. And Lamb Jones didn't work at his craft like he should have. And he would get discouraged, and then he didn't have coaches that would yank him out, so his confidence went there. But I seen him make some fantastic catches, 
and then uh, coupled with not uh, being healthy, that hurt him also. But uh, I see this talent that was there, and if I'd have been his coach, he'd have made me look like a god because I, I, I see talent. <laughs> and when you see talent, you have to develop it. And some coaches can't do that, and they can't see through it. And I know that some of the coaches that I had didn't give me enough credit of what my abilities were. And I remember uh, when we talked earlier about Chris Dishman when we are going into that game uh, uh, against uh, uh, the Oilers, and my own coach didn't give me the uh, credit that I really deserve. And this is a guy that I'm working for, playing for. And when you don't have that confidence uh, uh, that uh, or feel like a coach has the confidence, how do you, you know, give your 100%? I'm going to give that 100%, but how does that make you feel as a player when you don't have uh, a coach that feels confident in you, you know, and will label you in a certain way? And, uh, and that's the difference between a great coach and a good coach who can see talent and develop it. And that's why I feel like the Jets, uh, you know, stagger at that level of, you know, mediocrity and and get better, but just never have the coaching. I mean, we can go on from now to, to when you played, uh, the consistency of coaching. Like we talked about Rich Kotite being a, being, being yep. a, a head coach, and, and we all remember, Jets all remember, we want to remember to forget that, that Rich Kotite was the offensive coordinator in your days, and, and, and the guy yeah, that but, probably but, didn't yeah, – yeah. Yeah, and, and you know everybody says that Buck, and 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 and, and he was, and sometimes coaches have labels, and uh, and I remember you you could have a a running back coach coaching Freeman McNeil and never even played the position before. Uh, coach Tight had a, the the uh, the title as coordinator, but he was with Joe Walton. Joe Walton ran our meetings, ran the coordinating, he called the plays. Uh, Richie Kotite just had the title. And so, you know, it takes experience. Uh, you know, sometimes you're you're in with the, uh, certain ownerships or with people. How he got to be a head coach, you know, is beyond belief. Uh, and that's a fact. But <laughs> that's the politics of the game. You have coaches. We had a coach who was a special teams coach. And, and I remember he didn't want us wearing hats and chewing gum in the meetings, which was a joke to us. And we're the grown men. But and he never even had the experience as a coach, as a wide receiver, and and you don't have that respect as from a player coach standpoint. And how do you play and get better with that? And and, and those things kind of happen. And I've been disappointed this year with the Jets because I had a lot of respect for Todd Bowles and Mike McCagnan. But when you have guys uh, still coming late to meetings or the inner turmoil that's going on, and there is no discipline. Uh, things like that should not happen. And you think of uh, New England who who are consistent with winning, and you don't hear th- these type of things. And, and I, I'm sure Bill Belichick wouldn't even put up with that kind of crap. And and that's one of the things I've been disappointed with. And uh, this year with the defense, I mean, I, they came out like gangbusters, and, and they just fizzled. So, you know, you have to start questioning not only the players, but the coaches itself, you know. And they have a lot of soul searching to do, and I hope they can turn it around. But for heaven forbid, uh, you know, I have no idea what direction they're going on at this point. Now, you're in the locker room. We're speaking to uh, Wesley Walker. I don't want to say the other Walker. One day, I, I fuck is ridiculous. It's stupid sometimes. Who, but what Walker are you talking about? Herschel Walker? I don't know. Yeah, Herschel, too. I, I had him in my mind, too. Cause Cause I like, I've, I like I've, I've had people who say they're my, <laughs> my biggest fan. And uh, thanks a lot, Herschel Walker. You know, and I've been fan mail. I get Wesley. I get Wes Welker and stuff, and it's funny when you mention uh, Rob Moore, who I adore. Oh, I you're gonna, get a chance that's to see funny. Him. You can I have that. a picture. I have a picture in my uh, room. I have a little sports room. I call it the green room. When we go to the jet games, there's a green room we go to. So I call this room the green room. It's a little jet colors, and I got all my memorabilia there. But I had a guy bring me, and you know, I've had pictures of uh, Rob Moore in the Pro Bowl, and I have it right now, and, and they thought it was me. I have a, a picture where you can't <laughs> see the number. It's Al Toon, but I'm signing his picture. But I don't have the heart to hurt a, a fan who thinks it's me or that, that they don't really know any better, but I would never just, embarrass just sign, them. You know? just but sign, just sign, sign Al Toon. Just sign Al Toon. You know, that's a big deal. Ah, yeah, what the they, heck? They, they, sign, couldn't sign left hand. The, they couldn't tell by the number. I couldn't do that, you know, but it's really no, I, funny. But I got I, a, I got a picture of Al Toon and and Rob Moore in my, my in my memorabilia room. Ring of Honor wide receiver, one of my favorite Jets of all time. And I, I even mentioned on Facebook, I used to run routes saying I was you, like I was Wesley, and I went deep. If I caught the ball, I was gone, like you. You you just had some explosive speed after you caught the ball, you were gone. 
but you did it like in a, in, yeah. in a short motion. It wasn't like no long stride or anything like that. You just were gone like a lightning bolt. Now let's get back to the Jets, the Jets of now. People showing up late, forget about the, who it is on defense or offense. As a veteran in that clubhouse, are, are, are the players expected to say something to these guys? Or like, what, I would what, think what? so. I know, that I know we wouldn't put up with that. And I, I was with Marty Lyons in the Aruba this year, and that was one of the things that he was stating with, the, you know, you just have to have some type of leadership. And But then again, I know Brandon tried to take over that role, and then you hear this inner turmoil where they didn't have any respect for him, and now he's with the Giants. So I don't know. It's it's hard for me to judge and make certain assessments, and that's why I cannot prejudge or make a comment when I don't know firsthand why or what or what the reasoning or, or not being in meeting. So it's hard to make that distinction, and that's what's hard as an analyst or, or a former player because I don't like – blast in a player or a coach for something that may not be true unless you knew everything. And, and the unfortunate part, you know, coaches keep everything hidden. Sometimes you don't know. Guys even are hurt during the year that are really hurting during the year, and you can't disclose the injuries uh, uh, because they're going to get games and they're trying to not disclose certain things and try to uh, not have the teams have advantage. And those are things you just don't know. And, and you, I look at a guy that like Brandon Marshall who – and uh, Decker, who had a stellar season uh, 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 the year before, and then they come back this year with injuries and everything else, and you know, Fitzpatrick, you know, tanks, and uh, these things happen. And the Jets over the years have just been so in, uh, inconsistent. And I have to say, even during our time, you know, we were up and down. I mean, how do you go 10-1 and one and then take a five-game losing uh, skid? And that's just the typical of the Jets. But it, uh, things like that happen, and, you just have to just, uh, you know, buckle it up and try to do the best you can and hope every year is going to get better. And uh, I just appreciate the time that I did have, and I appreciate the fans, and I really appreciate you. Um, you know, I, I you know, it's a, uh, flattering that somebody tried to be you, and I, I'm just a regular guy. I'm True no story. different than you. But I don't picture people doing that with me, and it's very flattering. And it's a real good fans. I really love the fans. And when I got the ring of honor, I said that, and that's why I played that game. And I appreciate the real fans that really know you, and they, they bleed green, and they're going to be there through thick and thin, and that's a real fan. Oh, absolutely. We go through. I mean, we, actually, come on, we, Wesley. We're looking at a season where – you go in with three quarterbacks, four quarterbacks. You, I mean, the guy who's possibly going to win the job is, is coming in from Cleveland. You know what I mean? That I, I should say no more after that. Crazy. You know what I mean? It is it, crazy. It's insane. And I was, it's insane. I was sitting next to uh, at this dinner just last week with uh, Joe Namath, and I know he made a comment. He was hoping that uh, Hackenberg uh, steps up, and uh, I was sitting right next to him and introduced myself. And, uh, and you know, I was a big supporter of Geno Smith, uh, and, and and nobody really likes him. And I and I, I saw him after dinner, and I was just said, I'm pulling for you. So I, I remember seeing him training camp, and he throws a real nice ball, but he just had, hadn't had the experience and the time, didn't have the people around him. And then when he did, it looked like he was getting that opportunity. All the act, uh, all the other things happened with the, you know getting punched out and then getting hurt uh, uh, this year, and, and and you know and things like that keep happening. Uh, with the Jets being snake bit, but we're hoping Teddy can, uh, you know, pull out. But when you look at McGowan, you know, and you look at his record, it's just a recycled quarterback. And I don't know when this is going to stop, and I just don't see it happen. And if the defense doesn't play, it certainly is not going to happen. And I can relate to uh, this 10-1 and season when we had a stellar defense until we started getting injuries to our guys on defense. And then when we started to suffer there, we dropped off in our production on defense, and it affected our offense. It's a team sport, and everything affects each other, and that's what people don't realize. And uh, not only – and when I ever start a, a broadcast, guys have to stay healthy, number one, and you got to buy into the program, and hopefully they're going in the right direction, doing the right things. But, again, coaching and team and developing players are two different things. And uh, I'm just not so sure the Jets have that all together. And uh, when you have a championship run like that, all those things click together. And the Jets haven't found that uh, absolutely yet. Oh, man, I don't think until they get a quarterback in that situation, you know how it works out. Got to have a quarterback. I agree uh, with if- you. And if it I wasn't, agree with you. and if it was, I like Geno. I mean, I like Geno Smith coming out of uh, college, and I see the way he threw a deep ball. But you take the, you look at a kid in college, and and, and the pros are totally different. Uh, if he wouldn't have asked for his money back, or he would have just paid 
uh, that kid his money for some camp uh, over a, an airline ticket when these kids are making five, six, seven, ten million dollars. It, it's just a, it's just a mess. And 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 when 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 Rex Ryan was here, he was good, yeah, for a way with other people's players and motivating them. But he let the the, the inmates run the you know run the run the run the prison, and we all saw we all saw how it turned out. We loved them, but we it's like we had to get them out. And the guys like that, they come and go. They come and go, and you see that all the time. But let's take it back to you. I don't forget about the present Jets because it will give us Ajita, and we wouldn't even want to talk football. <laughs> 1977, you come in from California to New York. I mean, New, it's New York City now. I mean, it ain't the New York City that we know now. Uh, 1977 was a little different. The peep shows on Broadway and all that graffiti. Yeah, everywhere. I remember those. Yeah. <laughs> Disco yeah. And, 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 and South Bronx was pumping some uh, new music. It was called hip hop or something like that, right? Back in the 70s. Yep. You me, yeah. what, what was it like? Yeah. What was it like? What, do, you, do you remember but the first thing when you stepped into Manhattan? Pe- yeah, people, uh, the, you know, asking me that. And, you know, I, I'm from Berkeley, and I was like a black hippie, and, and, and I don't like, shoot, I'm, you know, I like the, the the nightlife and the you know, party just like the next guy, but I'll be honest with you, I didn't know the place really to go, so every time I would go to the city, I felt bored, and, and you know, and I'm like, where is this place that New York never sleeps? I couldn't <laughs> find it, but I'd be in Long Island, Every day of the week, I could go to a different place and and have a good time, and I I spend most of my time on Long Island. But I know the city now a little bit better. I just didn't know the places. But now I just I love. I mean, it's unfortunate we just had this incident in Times Square with the accident. But I love walking down in that area, going to plays. There's so much to do, and I appreciate New York City. But I hate driving. I don't like the traffic. It, it's just a, it's just a whole different animal. There's, there's the good side and there's a negative side. And, uh, but when I was younger, I swear, I'm like, where is this place that never sleeps? Because I'm trying to find it. I could never find it. It's funny thing. And I remember Richard Todd had an apartment in the city, and then we were told we we couldn't live in the city. And to me, it was always a hassle going in and getting back to Long Island because it's a late night and you have to get up for practice the next day or whatever. But I love being here. I'm I'm from California, and I stay here, and I'm still here. And my girl, uh, uh, my wife to me, uh, she wants to probably get out of here, but I want to stay. So we're trying to figure that out now. But I love ah. New York. I love the fans here. I don't like it when it snows a lot, but it it hasn't really been that bad since I've been here with the snow even. But I love New York. Yeah, there's something about Long Island. I'm from Rockaway Beach, Queens, so I'm kind of like on the board. I work. Yep, I, I work the beach I, out there. Yep. I work my nine to five. Uh, bars used to be every other block. I know there's a bunch of people from Rockaway yep. listening, in, probably I'm sure now, but. Uh, this is my hometown. I always say I want to get out. I want to get out, find a new place to live, and I, I, I never go anywhere. And then when I go on vacation, I'm happy. It even smells different, but I'm happy to be back because I guess it's a part of me, man. That's why I used to run my routes. Yeah. You know, I was 85, not Rob Moore. I was Wesley Walker, and my man Chris Snow yeah. used to throw the ball to <laughs> me sure deep, right? I think so. I turned. I yeah. turned into. I turned into Rob Moore. I did. I honestly did. Yeah. I guess. I mean, I'm not gonna I lie. Wish I knew Syracuse where Rob kid, Moore is, you know. Yeah, Syracuse kid. His father used to go to. You probably watched you yeah. a million times, as old man. You know, so good yeah. guy. They traded him for um for Jimmy Johnson, and that, that 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 was Jimmy Johnson. I think it was big big running back for the Cardinals and stuff like that. Traded for them, and yeah. remember out there. Yeah, it was it, it was good. It, it, I thought we were going up. And then we whatever we uh, forget about the Jets now. But you come to New York, you actually played in Shea Stadium. My first game that I ever seen in person. My uncle Dennis took me to Shea Stadium to see a football game at Shea Stadium. What was it like for the, all the young guys out there that are probably under thirty five and didn't even know the Jets played in Shea Stadium? What was it like playing at Shea Stadium? Well, I, you know, one of the memories because uh, it's you know you and I always like still I was always annoyed that we had to always share a stadium. And, and and the closest thing we had to having our own stadium was Shea, but we shared it with the Mets. So I never felt like we had our own stadium. But I, I just remember you you had to go down these steps into the dugout, and you come right face-to-face with the fans. So if uh, if you didn't do well, man, the fans were right on you. Shoot, they could spit on you and yell and say these vile things and, uh, I used to sometimes would watch fights in the stand, and I'd be saying to people, "It's just a game." And and I said today sometimes with these crazy <laughs> fans with alcohol and everything, and I just don't understand it sometimes. But it was always fun, uh, just to, you know, 
just kind of see how the fans were. But I just remember, man, some of these fans are crazy. It's still just a game. And and, and, and I remember I'm just wondering if somebody's going to hit me or take my head off going into the dugout. And that was one of the things that I remember uh, being young and, and, and uh, you know, playing uh, in front of the crowds in New York. But when I tell you, when you're winning, it's just nothing like it. And that's another thing. And, and like I said before, I've – uh, developed myself here, uh, and and the New York fan base has always been really good to me, and so I can't complain. And I really didn't get a a bunch of negative stuff that or my my stuff with the Jets. Oh, you know, I have some down things that I remember that could be depressing, but I I I I, I try to stay positive, and my experience has always been positive, even though I didn't have the perfect years or with the injuries. There's a lot that I didn't have a controller, and I wish I could change, but on the most part, I have to be thankful and blessed for my accomplishments and the things that have come my way in a positive direction. Uh, a lot of positive. You did have your injuries throughout your career. I mean, like anybody in football. Yep. And, and what you go through now, I'd like to get it later, but receiving yards, 8,300 yards, 71 touchdowns, and, and the amount of games you played, uh, forget about the ball thrown to you because you know that's not – you can't throw the ball to yourself. The best one I love yep. was the flea, the flea flicker in Cleveland – with Pat Ryan, I don't even know how. I mean, we know how Pat Ryan was in the game, but oh, uh, probably a nice guy. Don't get me wrong, but with Pat Ryan, yeah, in the I, love, game, the yeah, I love Pat Ryan. He can play. He just needed an opportunity. I, I'm telling you, when you get to this level, it's about opportunity. And unfortunately, Pat Ryan was our backup, and he had people in front of him. But if he got the chance to play, he could play. You know, and, no, he did and play. I he remember, did play. Uh, he, yeah, and uh, he would get me the ball if he could get to me. And I just, <laughs> we just weren't consistent up in a lot of different areas, but that's just the game itself. And and I'd always say, I don't care who's throwing it, just throw me the ball. You know, I wouldn't like Keyshawn Johnson throw me the damn ball, but he he said it. I wish I could have said that. I wish I could have said a lot of things, you know. But I always tried to take the high road. And and, and a lot of people don't know, I was very very frustrated being a Jet. I would see Alvin catching a hundred balls, I'm catching half and. I could get just as many yards or more yards and more touchdowns with half the catches. And that was very frustrating for me. So I always wanted those 100-yard uh, receptions. And, and I look at my career, even with my injuries, uh, uh, if, you, if if I could have stayed healthy, I probably would have doubled my numbers. And then, like I said, you're looking at the Hall of Fame type numbers, you know. I mean, I could I was close to even setting records. And I think we spoke before the year we went 10-1. and one, I could have broke the jet record and tied – or at least broke the NFL record, and we took a five-game skid, and they stopped throwing me. And it was very, 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 very disappointing because I, I still feel like the Jets and some people in the organization, especially when I got older, they didn't give me the the confidence or they didn't feel or I lost the step. They would say these innuendo things. Maybe it was a money thing. They didn't want to pay me. and uh, But I was still always proven. And I remember I would get knocked out of a game and uh, I became the star, but they just never uh, tried to, I guess, say, uh, put a focal point on me per se. And uh, that was very disappointment where, where you, you have coaches, you feel like they're not in your corner. But you have to play and you have to be a man about it and you still have to be professional. And I, and I was able to do that despite all that. That's a tough situation. If you had it all do it, do it over again, would you have said something? Do I throw me the damn ball, the Keyshawn? Not that, not no, that, no, not I'm that. Not but... that way. I'm not. That to me is immature. I look at some of these guys with the antics. I look at Odell Beckham, who is a superstar and he has all this talent, and uh, he doesn't have to do the things, and especially in critical times where he can hurt the team or you need this attention. And I remember Terrell Owens and. Ocho Cinco, and I love him, love him. Have Child, all please. There's a way you can do it, and you can do it in an entertaining way. Deion Sanders, was, it, he did things, but it was entertaining, but not where it becomes a detriment. And I do not understand. These guys can, you know, uh, I remember Santana at home, making a first down, and you're losing, and you're doing a, you know, you're, you're getting a first down, something that you're, you're supposed to do your job and you're trying to you direct this attention to yourself. And I just never got that. I could never be that way. And maybe if I would have done that, I could have got a lot more accolades and commercial or you know, being flamboyant, but it just never was my style. I, I never could be that type of person. You know, I, and I mean, this game and I'm just flipping the ball back to the ref, you know, after a touchdown or whatever, you know, but 
I, Absolutely. I, I always felt like, shoot, if I did something like that, somebody's going to knock my head off. But shoot, they're going to knock your head off regardless of what you do. But it's just not professional to me to uh, have to bring this attention in in a negative way. And and Odell Beckham, is, as far as I'm concerned, has been an embarrassment uh, as me as a wide receiver. And I'm not here to judge, but he doesn't have to be that way. Just do your job, you know. I don't, I don't know, but it's time for me to judge. That's the word we're kind of, It's not just Odell. It's a lot of people these days, you know. No, That's I know what you mean. I know got. what you mean. Yeah. It, 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 when yeah. it comes to the point where it comes to the point where it's just two two players are fighting on the field. I mean, enough is enough. Uh, it's just got hey, you. You just get tired of it, you know. It's yeah, like, yeah. So you, like you, like you, just Wesley. Do your you job. You know? down to Wesley. He would take the ball. You know, jump on a player or something like that. Raise his hands. Yeah, but flip the the ball. We flip right to the right to the, ref, to the referee. That's how. That's how people should teach their kids from from ground level pop Warner sports all the way up, and they don't yeah, have to worry I'm not, about. I'm, but yeah, I'm not saying you can't celebrate, it, but can do it in a professional. There's a there's a lot of guys that I laugh and it's entertaining and, and it's funny. But when you do things that are uh, uh, are, are, are like dirty or I mean, there's a lot of vicious hits out there where people are getting hung up and you, and you may maim somebody. And it gets to, to be so competitive where you start doing things that are, are out of the realm of what the game is itself. And that's where you start. To, I draw the line. You don't have to be that way. And there's, there's a, uh, there's a way to play this game and, and be professional. And, and I never got that. And I feel sorry for guys like um, that I played against. I played against Jerry Holmes and Bobby Jackson who – Tough, tough dudes, and they made me better. And I would put them up against anybody in the NFL. And you know, people will say, "Who's the toughest guy you ever fed?" And you know, I played against Mel Blunt, and the Mike Haynes, but my guys in practice were just as good, and they never got the accolades they, they, they really deserve. And that's what, what's real shame of it all. But and some of these guys are cut up in their careers, and the, the playing for the team or being a jet player defined them. I never let the, the NFL or that didn't find define me as a, a player. This is, was my job, and I always got away from it. I don't even really follow sports. And if anything, I watch movies. Even during the Super Bowl, I turned it off, and then I ended up turning it back on because I picked uh, New England to win, and uh, and I'm glad uh, they did. I was gloating. And people get mad at me because I like New England. They're <laughs> Come on, I'm you gotta understand Brady. that. I love no, Wesley. Wesley, you gotta understand I that, man. Crazy. Come on, I wasn't crazy. You gotta understand. I wasn't crazy we don't like about Belichick, them. but I. No, I love them. I don't like them. I love them. They, they're consistent. <laughs> that you strive for. I'm not jealous. I would want that for the Jets. You know, they somebody should maybe model them to try to figure out what they're doing and try to get, do that. You know, but for the life of me, with these owners that have money, I don't know how they cannot. Find a professional coach, somebody consistent, and pay the man and get somebody that knows what they're doing. No, I agree. I agree. But you said you talked about people like 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 say on Dell Beckham. But how do you how do you guys deal with like uh, Mark Gastineau doing his cheers down twenty points? He's jumping up and down. You guys on the sideline, I must have said, what is this guy doing? I mean, I understand it's the well, part of the, see, the the routine, but come on. Well, see, I never. Judge anybody. Hey, you do your job, and that's what you do. That whatever your personality is, there's and and that's and, and I hate to say this, and I always felt that we weren't together. We always preached this family. Uh, there was a lot of dissension on the team. There was a lot of clicks on the team. Even early on in my career, a lot of prejudice, and I never got that because I came from Berkeley, where I, I love everybody. I'm a black hippie. And uh, <laughs> I, I didn't understand uh, the racism, and I thought when you get to the pro level, you wouldn't have this. And, it wasn't that way, and I felt like we weren't as close. I mean, guys hated each other. Uh, you, know, you mentioned Gaston. They were jealous. And, and obviously, Gaston didn't do all the right thing, but he's still your teammate. And uh, a lot of people were jealous. And I had guys on my team that would be jealous. It could be women and, and talking about women before a game. You're, you're worried about who, but is dating who. And I just never got that stuff. You know, you were supposed to be family, and I felt like, if we were closer that way, uh, we would have bonded and we would have been better. And I think that was one of our detriments as a team. And we weren't together and we didn't even know each other. You know, we all did our, our own thing, you know, which is, I think, a detriment. And I can remember Joe Walton getting mad because one of the players had a party and didn't invite everybody. And uh, he called them all out. And there was a lot of decision when we went on strike with guys. And I used to see that they would do to Mark Gasson. And Mark, uh, you know, wasn't uh, the teammate that, you know, uh, 
he won him to be, but he wasn't a bad guy. And I always had a lot of respect for him. And now he's going through a lot. He's he's had cancer. Uh, he's got a lot of issues going on, as well as a lot of other players do. And uh, now we're finding out with this, the contact with the head injuries. There's a lot of things with memory injuries, obviously. And I'm going through my battle with injuries and everything else like that. But I was just so disappointed that we weren't together and close as a family as we tried to make it out to be. And I just hope the Jets uh, now, I hope it doesn't get like that. And I, I don't know what their makeup or what identity they have. I don't know what uh, Todd Bowles is trying to project over to the team, I don't but think they, they have know. to get better. I don't better. think they know either. I don't think they know either. Wesley. Well, I, I know honest. I don't know. So. Hey, I got a bunch of things I want to talk about. One thing off the bat is – uh, talking about, I said that you gave, you scored a touchdown on a young DB, uh, Chris Dishman, and he told me to mention it to you. Do you remember that play that he scored? Uh, back, I said, what, what year was he drafted? Yeah, but that's that's funny I how he remembers. He and no, no, I, I, um, you know, I don't remember how young he was, and and I was probably you know. Where people think that I'm washed up because I know there was a comment uh, made that they didn't think I was that fast, but I remember they came in with this house of pain, and and I was proud from the standpoint, you know, and it wasn't a gloat uh, against the uh, the Oilers, is the fact that I never forget they 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 kind of stopped throwing me ball. They didn't give me the accolades that I really thought I deserved, and I'll never forget this. Al got knocked out of the game, and I'm I'm looking at I mean his head was back in his head, and I'm like, I hope I never get hit like that. It was because he had a problem with concussion. I mean he was a big target, but I remember him getting knocked out, and uh, I got MVP of that game. I scored three touchdowns, and and it's not to call out Chris Dishman. I remember you know uh, you know <laughs> beating right. him, but it wasn't good. just Chris Dishman and everything else. I had three touchdowns that day. And I wanted to tell the coach, and, and that's where I wish I could have said, well, who is the, the best guy now? You know, and here, you know, I made the MVP, but they still never gave me that opportunity. And uh, and, and and that was in the latter part of my career, I think, you know. I forget what year that was. Uh, and, and But everybody, oh, I lost a step, I did this, that, and other thing. And I, I can prove people wrong. And I worked hard. And, uh, and I had a lot of issues going on with my body with injuries that people don't even know about. But I remember that game distinctly because I had three touchdowns, and I just remember Al getting knocked out. And I wanted to say, well, here is – I can do this, but you never gave me the credit, you know. And it wasn't welcome. Uh, you like, welcome a, a to the dish, House of uh, Pain. I never would – 45 to 3. My opponent. Yeah, but I would never dish uh, my opponent, you know. Uh, no, nah, I even know that. underestimated us or whatever, too. You know, I don't know. Well, he remembers. Chris but Dishman I do remember remembers. that game. He remembers because he said to me, I, I spoke to him off the air, I mean, through, through Facebook, and I was like, oh, you can come on the show? He said, yeah, I'll come on your show. I, and thank you for coming on tonight, uh, Wesley Walker, Ring of Honor member, New York Jets. Uh, in my heart, you're a Hall of Fame in my heart because I remember doing pass patterns. I was, I was you. I was you. Running well, pass really patterns. Appreciate the hippie, it. The hippie from California, I was him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, hey, and, I, and, and, and you mentioned Mark Gassino, and we got honored together. And, you know, he's having some issues, and I felt bad for him, too, because uh, uh, he, 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 there was comments made that he when he made his little speech and they made reference to him and Joe Namath when he, uh, Joe Namath had that meltdown with the uh, girl on the sideline, Sita Cobra, I think it was. And, uh, uh, and, and Mark didn't have anything to drink. He just drank coffee, and I was with him during that time. But we all are having some personal issues right now, and it's a shame that people can – jump on you or they they have these preconceived ideas about you. Uh maybe we didn't do all the right things but uh uh but you know, people do change and hopefully you learn a lesson I and I'm sure Mark has changed a lot because he's really religious now but we all are having some issues at this point in time with the bodies and our minds and everything else and you just hope they get the help they need and, and certainly the NFL hasn't done enough to try to correct that situation or to even help the summer players like they try to make it out to be. See that that was the question I had for you. What has the NFL done for you after retirement? And what what are, what are, what nothing? Absolutely nothing. What what are some of the injuries you nothing. went through? I know you had knee, you had knee everybody, injuries, everybody. your shoulder, your neck, uh, back. Yeah. I'm sure, right? Uh, what what injuries? I, I, you... I was able to I was able 
able to file for workman's comp where I get my neck and my back taken care of, but I was a teacher for about 25 years, so any surgeries that I do get is through my school insurance that I have. And now that I'm retired, uh, you know, and, and at least I could, uh, you know, I, in my program through the school, I could buy into the program for insurance for life, whereas I wish there was something like that the players can uh, buy into, which you can't. And, and the program that they do have the offer, nobody will even sign you up. But they try to give you the facade that they do all these things, but there's nothing they've done for me, and I'm hoping it will get better. I'm hoping the NFLPA and the NFL will find some way to address some of these issues because uh, you not only have the concussion thing, but you just have your body that falls apart and guys can't even get insurance. And uh, that's one thing. And we just didn't think about those things at the time. You're young. And, uh, and, uh, and I look at my career and things that you think about now. And even I was a union rep, and there's some things that I didn't even know. Uh, there's things that you're entitled to, how to even take your pension, what benefits you want and try to get to, or or for your spouse or uh, beneficiaries, and if you don't do it the right way, you can get screwed and have nothing. So it's but absolutely you don't amazing. Have anybody really educating you? See, the thing that gets me with the NFL, they print their own money right now, and everybody knows that. Anything they do, they print. They actually print their own money. Their own like it's like their own government, and they, they just, just have enough money to take care of almost everybody that has played in the NFL. And it's a shame they're trying to come back and say how they they soften the game up. Uh, no practices back to back. I'm sure it's a different game. Route running. Can you so imagine now? Can you imagine game. now? Can you imagine now? You, you go to the line up I wish. and and. Yeah. and <laughs> there's no bump and run no more. There's, you touch them. I, I feel like this, the games now in the NFL are decided more by the referees with the flags, with the, with the, the pass interferences and the rough and the pass. So I've seen all the quarterbacks back then get killed. I mean, we saw Kenny O'Brien get killed first to Bears in 1986 or 85, I believe it was. He got, I mean, it was, I felt bad for him, man. That's how much he was getting. Oh, he got something. killed a lot. He got killed uh, a lot. <laughs> and I wonder, and I asked we you, and I asked bad for him. And I asked you, I said, how is, I wonder how he's doing but, uh, uh, after something like that. But what, what, is, what is a concussion? Like back then, when you got hit hard and you, you had no clue what a concussion is, what, what, how would they No, you didn't even game? say nothing. You, you, you wouldn't even say nothing. I mean, I can remember getting banged. And I'm seeing stars, and, uh, and we called the play. And I remember going out to the silent, and I didn't remember the play until I got to the – uh, to the play was almost called, uh, and you just go in and you just play with it. You know, there is no protocol, there is no nothing, and that's okay. And I think about the guys who played before me in the fifties or whatever, and and that's okay too. But what I do uh, mind is when they discover this information, and then the the NFL tries to uh, put these blinders on it, or they didn't know about it, and when they did know about it. They still didn't disclose it, and then they lie about it. And, and I and I and I, uh, I to Roger Goodell, and Roger Goodell, believe it or not, worked as an intern for the Jets. And when he got the job, I'm thinking, you know, he will really change this. But you see the money and the power and the change. And I watched him. Uh, there's a if you you can go to uh, the internet and you watch the League of Denial and how they tried to cover this uh, whole thing up with the concussion. And you hear Roger not even answer the question in Congress, and a mother whose son has died couldn't even be represented. And you see all these things that are happening, and they kind of like just lied about it and put everything to the side. And they're and like you said before, they're trying to change the rules and give you the f- facade that they're doing something. But this is business. They're making a ton of money. Uh, but some of these issues just have to be addressed. And I just wish – if anything, in that movie, I really saw concussion, concussion, and Will Smith says, you know, just tell the truth, and you never will get the friggin' truth. And I, I hate to say it, but that, that's the business aspect of it. And a lot of times we just can't say certain things what we would like to. A lot of guys won't say a lot what is really true. A lot of, I say, 90% of the players would want to play this game regardless because they either needed the money or want the money or like the accolades. Me, if I knew what I felt like right now, I was going to be like I am now. I wouldn't even play this game, to be honest with you. So I would have been, I would have been like Kurt Sohn running the passes as a kid, then, right? Or, or not Altuve at the time, <laughs> hey, but hey, somebody else. I love Kurt Sohn. 
I, I used to watch. It's funny you mentioned it. Kurt Stone was one of my best friends. We used to get in so much trouble together. And <laughs> I used to watch him and Bobby Jackson go at it every day in practice. And Kurt was fast, too. And he he would be slamming the ball in front of Bobby Jackson. Bobby Jackson would be in his face. And they would go at it. It would just be funny. But I always had a great deal of respect for Kurt Stone. He was good. And like I said, I had I, I had my best game against uh, Miami. And I had a strain going during the week and missed all the week of practice. But I came in, had the game, the stellar game. And I remember uh, all the reporters being around. And I said, you know what? I dedicate this game to Kurt Stone. Other people that you guys don't know, he's doing practice. And then here I come in, play this game, getting all these accolades. And this guy is busting his butt. And I, I get all the accolades. And I, I never liked that. And I love my teammates. And uh, he's certainly one of those guys that I love. Now, you take us back to that game because you brought it up. Four touchdowns. I think I've looked at it a thousand times. Six catches, 194 yards, and four touchdowns. Just the way that the, 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 the tie-in touchdown uh, it was a 51, what was it, 51-45 win in overtime. But just the catch, yes. the, the, third, the third catch was out, outstanding. It was back and forth, back and forth. I, I posted that on Facebook, a, a YouTube video, and somebody wrote up, a uh, terrible game. I was like, this guy, man, he's yeah, really he trying was, to hate. What a terrible game. I remember Joe Greco made a joke about that. You know, it, uh, it, it was a great game, but nobody was stopping each other. So it just depends on how you look at it. Uh, you know, it was a high-scoring game, but he, if you look at it from a defensive standpoint, it's not a great game. So it just depends on the individual, what you're into. Uh, it's a game that I will never forget because that was a game that, I thought uh, I, I was even going to sit out because I, I, I actually thought – I told Kurt, get ready to go in. I might as well save my groin because I'm, he's not throwing me the ball. You know, and I, we had to beg and plead with him to do certain things. And it was really funny because on one of the deep balls, uh, uh, the second one, we, I, my second touchdown, we begged and begged, and he, he calls it. And uh, Miami was in the right coverage, and Kitty stuck it in between two defenders, and I was able to make the, the – move on a guy and went in for the touchdown. And, but the one that I tied in um, in overtime with no time left, it, that was just a good play by Kenny O'Brien. And matter of fact, I was on the sidelines at the time, and he tells me, what's you get in there? And it's a formation that we had that we always worked on in practice, and you never get these opportunities. And finally, it's here. I'm on the sideline. He had me go in, and how we stuck it in there, how I caught it, and it was like a dream to this day. I don't remember it. The ball just stuck in my head. I'm like thinking, how did this happen? This is like unreal. But I wish all the games were like that. I wish we won all the time. I wish all the games were like that. And I stayed healthy. Then I probably would miss it. But being hurt and losing, never like that. So that's why I don't miss it. See, back and forth, that game went back and forth, back and forth. For a football fan, especially a Jet fan, and I remember that game because that's the same. This is the same year the Mets were running wild. I'm 13 years old, and I'm, I mean, I, I football. I mean, who, a 13 year old kid, man. I'm watching the game back and forth, back. But it was just the excitement of the back and forth game, knowing usually the Jets are on the other side of that. And finally, it felt like we were on the right side for, for once. You know what I mean? For once. But four touchdowns. Yeah, what, what about game? the people that left? There were some people. There were some people that left the game and then tried to get back in and couldn't get back in. <laughs> that was that was like when when I went to the game to Monday Night Football versus Miami. This is before after your career. Uh, when uh, what's your quarter yep. even quarter I pass? Jumbo Elliott quarter pass. A lot of I people was left that game. that game. I was doing I was doing TV um, and radio stuff. I was doing the pre and post game, and I remember my whole family. I'm, I'm calling them. It's like a one, two, and one. I forget and. And uh, my all my kids were like, are you watching this? And I'm like, I, you know, because in, in the beginning, I was kind of falling asleep. And uh, it ended up being a great game. It's unbelievable. I don't know what it is about the Miami games, how that happens. Oh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I understand the fake snap. Uh, the, the, it's, just, it's just something. I don't know. Whatever. Yep. But, you know, as bad as it is, Miami didn't history. go on and win so many. They didn't win championships. So that didn't really bother me. But to the point where New England just puts a can of whip on us. I mean, we usually play them good in the regular season, but you all know how it's going to turn out. Uh, and whatever, forget about New England. Let's talk about yourself. Now, you told me a story, and I saw it on uh, an interview you had on the Internet, and it was something about uh, along this line of you driving home on Long Island, and then all of a sudden you're in Manhattan, and you didn't know how you got there. And, and that's what a time yeah. it kind of scared you, right? That that's kind of scary, man. Yeah, and it's and and and, and that bothers me too. And I know my girl is getting really annoyed at me because um, 
I, I, I don't know. I'll leave my keys with the car open, and, and we've had some people in the area, you know, burglarizing, and I've left my keys. Like the, just last night, the keys with my door open in the car. I've left my keys in the front door all night several times. I left my car running in the driveway for six hours and going and doing, doing something. Then I'm like, oh, I come back in my car and still run. I'm like, holy crap. I did that going to a store once with uh, my daughter and, uh, and, and my girl. And I'm like, oh, God, I left the car running while we are in there shopping. And uh, and, 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 and I do, I call it sleep driving, and, and sometimes I'll drive now, and I feel like I'm going the wrong way. I, I, I could be just a couple taking my kids to school. I've been a million times, and I feel like I'm going the wrong way or I make a wrong turn. But in this case, uh, there was a, a lady, dear friend of mine, and uh, she died of cancer, bless her. She's like my second mom, Ingrid. I used to stay with her in Belmore. So and the funniest thing, my house, she opened up her house. So I used Stay with her a lot. I'm heading there. I go there every day. It's 20 minutes from my house. Next thing I know, I'm at 108 Street because I used to teach over there before Hill High School. 108. See that? I had to turn around and go back. I'm like, how the hell I ended up there? I did that when, uh, and this is, I was still playing at the time, and I did that um, visiting my mom and ended up in uh, almost in Palm Springs, you know, which is 45 minutes from my, my mom's house, you know. And I'm like, I've been doing this for a long time, but now it's getting to the point where uh, my girl is getting really, really annoyed, and it really bothers her sometimes, too, because I'm, like, forgetting stuff, and I don't know. So you just kind of keep an eye on things. And, and now when you just worry with all the stuff that they're relating, some of these um, uh, um, brain injuries with Parkinson's, uh, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, and whatnot. And I've I've actually been tested for the Parkinson a, a while back, and I had a piece of um, – they did a biopsy. They took a piece out of my thigh and a piece out of my, uh, my tricep. And uh, this is before all my major uh, surgeries to my back, because in 214 I had shoulder surgery, back surgery, and my Achilles. But – couple times, uh, maybe three or four years prior after my next surgery in 2007, I was getting tested for Parkinson's, you know. And I and this was done through my rheumatologist because he saw these, my skin would be twitching, and uh, and he was looking at me, and he didn't even tell me that he sent me to a neurologist, and I didn't find out until after I went to the city to this neurologist that they were checking that out. He didn't even tell me. It didn't scare me. But, wow. but now... When you look at things that are happening to guys, you start to wonder about certain things. So that's why I say now, uh, I wake up in pain every day. I don't sleep. Uh, For seven years, I was taking painkillers, which is not healthy for you, and I wasn't addicted to it. But I would just take them just to pass the time. But there was a point in time where the highlight of my day was to take a two Vicodin, drink an orange soda, and take a shower and get back in the bed. And uh, there was a, wow. a time where I would sit there at the edge of my bed saying, God, geez, would you just take this away? And I still have pain constantly in my hands and nerve damage and just over the culmination of what's happening. So right now I walk as much as I can. And here I was one of the fastest in the NFL, uh, and I, I can't even uh, jog or, or, you know, hardly walk since days and, I remember when I was teaching elementary, when I knew I couldn't beat my elementary school kids across the gym floor, I knew I was in trouble, you know. Uh, but uh. that's scary. That is really scary. And that's the part. That's the that's part. the part that the NFL is totally like you know just blacking out from the from any any public and stuff like that. Well, you see, like Junior say, I was, I'm not saying what happened, but yeah, uh, you know, crazy. take his life. Uh, your brain shakes around in that skull, regardless of even being hit. By and I don't I don't know which football player it was off top of top of my head there was a giant I believe I don't know it could have been Carson it could have been Marshall one of them went yeah. for one of the MRIs and the doctor said well you were in a car accident or something like that this is what I heard and he said no I play NFL football I mean that's the way his brain yeah. is batted around I mean it's it's scary man yeah. it's definitely scary a lot of people that I know Leonard Marshall is going through that and Harry Carson is really good from the standpoint. He wants the players that really need it, and he really needs it, but he won't even allow his, his grandson to even play, period, you know. And See, now uh, that's, I could that's, never that's the point. I wanted to bring it up with Wesley, with Wesley Walker, New York Jets, on the Bucker Tano show. Now, I, I got my, my son who's nine years old. My oldest son played football. 
but he, he kind of didn't really, I mean, he, I guess he liked it, but he, he kind of left it. He really wasn't him football, I guess, you know, a baseball kid, basketball, could shoot really good. From three, but he's a good, good kid. Just graduated from high school this year, too, um, from Brooklyn over in, uh, I don't want to get whatever. But he graduated. My younger guy's nine years old. He plays offensive line. And, a big, and I got to give you, you got to give a big shout out to the BCAC, Broad Channel Shamrocks, right? Coached by my good friend, Brad Polisi. He runs the team. Um, the way they teach the kids these days, they teach them proper. I know it's the, I mean, anything can happen on the football field. But how would you say to me now, I have my son, you, like Leonard Marshall and, and these greats wouldn't let their kids play, you know, grandkids play football. Uh, like, I know your kids play lacrosse and stuff like that. Do you suggest that kids play? Yeah, they play football? football too. They played football. Oh, they did. They, they did play, play football. Okay. They did. Yeah, they were good. They just got scholarships to. But what do you say uh, to people? What do you say to people like me? What do you say to people like me? We would put kids. Well, right? I, you 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 have to do your research and you have to know what's really going on and you have to know, the, say the coaching, the techniques, and and I know there's a lot of coaches that I, over the years that I've even, you know, when I was coaching uh, at the high school. And I would never uh, embarrass another coach. And, and the coach may be teaching a certain technique, and, and I would never tell him it's wrong. And even if you thought it was wrong, I would just tell him this is the way I would do it. But right now, um, you, I would have to, with my kids, or especially on, on, when they're young, because, hey, kids can get hurt, and they could have concussions in high school or even the PAL. I've seen some hits on these little peewee kids on my – that is not right. They should not even be hitting like this. But I'd have to do the research on the coaching and the organization and, and the type of things that they're doing. And you have a lot of now. You have a lot of flag football teams. I'd be more inclined to have my kids do that. But I I would never discourage my kid from not wanting to play. If they wanted to play, I'd have to uh, let them know uh, at least the ramifications that can come about that and hopefully get them into a, a good program and coaching. And you got to look at that because – it, not only the, from a professional standpoint of hitting and being taught technique-wise, you have a lot of personality classes with the, some of these parents and the old years I've seen that they, they're not even appropriate with behavior and what they're teaching kids. <laughs> one it's of amazing. Kids, I remember yeah, I had uh, one of my kids coaches in the PAIO when he, literally, he, he was overweight and smoking cigarettes while he's talking to the kid. That didn't make sense <laughs> to me. So you, you want to you know, Put them in a, a nice program, and you want to think about their technique. And there's a lot of organization out there. I'll give you, again, just like the NFL, give you the facade like they're doing all these technique-wise, but they're not really really following a protocol. And uh, right now, uh, certain businesses, when they're making money at this, they do certain things, or they'll protect certain things, or they'll say statistics-wise, they're doing this, that, and the other thing, and we have our, our injuries cut down. And it's a crock. And, uh, and this is a contact sport. It's something that can't be avoided. Uh, you can hopefully try to teach the kids the proper technique. But, hey, a kid can fall down, hit his head, and, and get a concussion, and land the wrong way, break your neck. And that's the reality of it. And if you don't have the reality of what can happen, then, you know, then you shouldn't even be involved. But that's just a, the whole reality of it because uh, at some point uh, you play this game long enough, you're going to get hurt. It's just part of the deal. So either you make the choice to play the game or you make the choice not to play the game. You're right. You're right. But you can't you can't also coach the other team, the opponent team coming in, too. So that could be dangerous, nope. too. And, you, and you're right. Yeah, you're right. The, everybody's the, different. You're right. And and the parents these days, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the truth, Wesley. I, I, I love football. I let my kid play football. But I, I, I like the, the basketball, the hockey, because when it comes to hockey, right, you coach a hockey team. This is for me now. Not too many parents played hockey before. Everybody, all the parents have played baseball, football, basketball. So they all know everything. So that was the only sport really where I had, I felt comfortable with parents that didn't really come yelling at me because they didn't know what was going on anyway. So it's like, you know, right, 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 right. I, when I watch my kids well, play any kind of sports, besides I coach my little guy, I used to stand near the foul poles because I didn't want to hear when I see a kid on a mound, he's pitching. And every, after every pitch, he's looking at dad and he's looking for dad's reaction. or he's looking at mom's reaction, which is crazy. I'm saying to myself, what is going on? If youth sports are, I mean, you can watch it on TV with the tiny tikes and whatever. Yeah. It's, Monday night. it's uh, insane. Yeah. I've seen it. Amazing. I've seen it with some of my teammates uh, uh, and their sons and their kids, or they're in the son, son stands watching, fighting with the refs and fighting with the <laughs> other parents, and, and or they live vicariously through their kids trying to play and, and thinking they're going to get drafted or whatever. 
instead of just letting, uh, you know, uh, just nature take its course sometimes. But I don't get that either, man. And, uh, and I remember pulling my kid off the team with the coach who was cursing, or I remember one of the coaches playing baseball, and it's 90 degrees, and it's the first year of the players, and they're fooling around, kind of, and he's yelling at them, they suck, you know, and I don't, <laughs> I don't buy that. You know, I'll pull my kid in a minute if, if it's not the right thing you're doing by the kids, and, 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 that's, and that's when you really got to research that type of thing, you know. But, uh, you know, you, you got to know that you got to have certain personality classes. That's just the way things are. And that's why you have to research it and put people in the, or your kids in a, in a nice program that, or at least something that's appropriate that you, you're going to feel comfortable with. Yeah, that coach who said to your son, you suck. He should have turned it to A.J. Dewey off the interception. You should have crushed him. Lowered your shoulder and just yeah. crushed him. No, I'm not saying you would have, but in your mind. You ever see like the movie? You're a book movie guy. Wait, you know they like black out and they like dream like yeah, I guess he just like, you just wanted and the, the agent doing you felt like knocked him out you know like boom but yeah. I, you wouldn't have done that I know yeah. I know you wouldn't have done that no I you know I, hey there's you know I could hate you and you will never know it yeah I I tell my girl that all the time you just have to keep a poise about yourself but you know I would never let my guard down or not let anybody know stuff. I mean you get some obnoxious people I you, you know I get you know obnoxious fans or something I'm going to treat you with respect, and I may not even disrespect you, but I'm not going to try to embarrass you, but you'll never know that I, I despise you, you know, and because I, I'm just a nice person, and, and I'm beyond that where, you can, you know, at some point you can just walk away and not deal with this type of attitude. But there are some people that I have to be around that I can't stand being around, but that's life in general, you know, and we all exactly put on a facade, right. and I can do that. I did it as a plan with the gents and be seething, and I, because there's nothing I can really do it. It's beyond my control. So you can only control yourself and do what you can do, and and that's what I have to do in life. You can only control what you can control, and or try to make it the best way you can, you know. And and I and a lot of that is through my blessings, through God and everything else, who uh, keeps me grounded. And uh, you know, you just got to keep a good place in your heart. And, I, I, I thank my parents for giving me just a good disposition like that in life. Period. I just can't let things bother me that just don't mean anything because life is so short. I have a uh, – with my girl, I have a caregiving business, and I work with the elderly, the handicapped, people with disabilities, and also in hospice care. And when you see somebody that's dying and what is going to the families and 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 I can be of some assistance to try to help – uh, I'm not saying I'm the cure-all, but just try to bring some happiness or at least something to a person just giving them help. And I don't think my situation, I have a lot of pain and suffering I'm going through with my injuries, but I can take a, a, a situation in hospice or people that I know they're struggling with cancer, and I'm blessed with what I have compared to what they're going through. So it could always be worse. So I, I look at the, the blessings that I do have because there's a lot, a lot of problems out there and a lot of pain and a lot of things that people are going through that we don't even realize. We take it for granted. And I certainly wouldn't trade places with myself in their situation. So that's the way I look at life in general. So you just try to do the best that you can. And I thank God for what I've been blessed with. And you hopefully try to carry it over to other people and they can do the same thing. And so on that note, I, I mean, where, where can we go from there? You know what I mean? I was going to ask you how the Jets, uh, how is your relationship with the Jets now? But who cares? I mean, I have to come off that. Well, I'm on Long Island. I, I'm really good. I mean, I, I know Todd Bowl has welcomed us back. And it's a shame, too, because I do miss being at Hofstra. I'm here in Dix Hills. I'm 20 minutes from Hofstra. And I miss it. It takes me a couple hours to get to Florham Park. Uh, on on without traffic and, and getting to the Meadowlands sometimes I and I have an appearance to do on the 24th at the Jets and stuff it's just crazy and and, it, and it, it's traffic it's it's a problem but I have a good relationship with the Jets I have a a, a girl that works there Ashley Kirby who's wonderful and and the people that I, that don't even work for the Jets I've always had a good relationship I went to every game I do these appearances still doing these appearances. And most of them are through the Jets, you know. So I do have that relationship. I just wish they would do more uh, in a sense uh, where uh, they can create a program because I know the fans would love it. 
but the, the, the players need to be compensated at some point uh, the way to, you know, because a lot of people can't uh, afford to go do some of these things they want you to do, but they, they want you to work and, and let's say sign autographs and go to suites and this, that, and other, but they don't want to compensate you for that, you know. And, and, and there's some programs where I know they could even do that, and I know the Giants do a very good job at that, uh, but there's a lot of things they could do with the, the current and, and former players and with the fan base because I think the fan base would want to have something or have some type of relationship or where you can mingle together, but it, it, it has to be done in the right way and a proper way. But uh, right now, um, I, they, do make, they kind of try to do it the cheap way. That's mind boggling. You know what mind boggling? This is this is Buck Rotano. This is not this is not Wesley Walker speaking right now. But uh, it's a shame because everybody goes in their in their bathroom. You could pull out at least three Johnson and Johnson products. The guy is. I mean, we're talking money. In there, just the NFL. Oh come on, Woody! You gotta do. They gotta do. I know it's not Woody himself, but the Jets have to do a better job of bringing out the old guy. Because I, I, I mean, that's my, that's my, my memories of what you guys, and, and you know, and well, I'm basing it on two, uh, and I'm, ba- I'm just basing on people that I know who are really Jet fans, and 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 I know the Giants. Like uh, even there was a couple guys that uh, he played for the Jets. They only had a short stint. And he says, Wesley, the Giants they pay us to come to to the stadium when they do these simple appearances that we do, and it's not that way. And, and maybe the Jets need to take a mold from other teams. And I'm sure there's a lot of teams out there are worse, but I know a lot of guys or a lot of fans would like to try to create some type of program and you meet the players, and they could create some of these players, and uh, and 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 it can be compensated in a certain way for uh, for the fans and the players to do something in a positive way where. The fans would even want to be there, but right now the way the Jets are producing, I don't even know if they can get it because a friend of mine even uh, called me the other day and saying it looks like the Jets they have this thing called the Taste of uh, the Jets, and it's a thing where they have current uh, players and former players and uh, food, and uh, I guess they were charging two forty nine or two fifty or something like that, but then they had a fat last sell and reduced it for a hundred bucks. So a friend of mine texted me this thing and said, I guess they're having a problem selling it out. But when you don't put the product on the field and, and, and you're trying to, you know, um, engage alien, alien ticket you guys, pricing much. out of the market, you know, you're, you're kind of alienating some of the people. You know what? They're getting paid a lot of money. They're not getting the product out there. And they're not getting what they should or at least what they think they should get back in return. I thought you guys went on a bunch of cruises. You went to the Bahamas. They took care of you. I mean, that's, no, that's, that's, I mean, that's no, being they, a fan. They, that's what I would think. No, they – they had two cruises, and the one thing didn't work all that well. I, the I Titanic and the Lusitania. I think the Jets, are, you know, but I know they did. Uh, the, they did it with this one company, and then I don't think it went all that well. Then the Jets tried to do it on their own, and it, it didn't go that well. And I don't even think they're having it this year. You know, I, I know. In fact, because I, I, I ran into Marty Lyons, uh, I took my girl on uh, for her 50th birthday to Aruba. And the Jets happened to be there, and I was just running around and trying to have a drink. And I said, I'm in the room. But he said, yeah, I'm here too. And so I, I happened to go to this hotel. And I'm walking through. I hear all these people, and there's a bunch of uh, fans and, and uh, uh, players from the Jets and, and, and people that work for the Jets. It was kind of funny. And then we ended up getting together. Who told Wesley, who, who thing, told Wesley went down here, right? They're like, who told Wesley? I didn't tell him. Yeah. I didn't tell him. No, no. He came down here by himself, and like, man. And what I'm doing here, you know. It was funny. It was, it was so funny. Everybody. I got but something like for you. A- I know I know that you're not a big uh, sports fan. You're not really into sports or that like that. But if you ever wanted to go out to Belmont Park, I would love to go out there and spend an afternoon just to hang out with Wesley Walker, and I'll show you how to, to, to pick some picks. Or I, I, know, I have some of my All friends right, well, tell you me. You have to let me know when you do, because the Belmont, I, I actually like it. I remember I used to go out with my father-in-law once. He loved the horses, but. I, the last time we were there was with uh, with the Pharaoh. I think we went to a thing, and uh, but it's got a nice. I just don't know anything about it, but it, I'll meet you one day. You just let me Absolutely, absolutely. Make listen, a day out of it. Yeah. Listen, Long I, I, I bring my girl. Now, you, I would, no, dude, you kidding me? You could bring anybody you wanted, man. Absolutely, <laughs> you kidding me? No, nah, so listen. You made you made my night uh, for a big time Jet fan and. I know that the Jets don't take care. You'll look at that that way. But a guy is 40, 40, going to be 42 years old. 
I felt like, like like it was Christmas Eve. I was getting ready to talk to you. Uh, the shit is, I mean, I did hundreds of interviews, and I didn't. I was all shook up leading up to this interview. Man, like, I got oh, twenty oh. years on you, man. You try to make you feel low. I got twenty years on you. I'm, I'm just telling 62 you, man. Sixty-two this May. <laughs> sixty-two. Yeah, my all right. Son, my youngest son is getting married on my birthday, May twenty-sixth. Uh, I'll be 62, and my son is getting married on my birthday. So Con- congratulations. I got some years on you, bro. <laughs> nah, it's all right. It's, all, it's, only, it's only numbers, but congratulations to your son, man. Yeah. He's, they're, 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 your boys you. are still on, they're still on Long Island themselves, too? He, well, they're in New Jersey. My my oldest and, uh, is in uh, Flemington, New Jersey, and my my uh, my youngest is in Clifton, and my daughter is married. She's in uh, North Miami Beach. Oh, so spread and around all, a little bit. And so every, every so they're thirty, thirty two and thirty three. But my actually my son is uh, my oldest son is uh, gonna be thirty four. Uh, this is birthday. Wow. I just realized I got a call with that. I almost forgot about that. So put it in put it in your phone. You know what it is? I'll text you Saturday early in the night. I'm not doing it, I'm just joking around. <laughs> I would, I said, I'll text you, I'll give you a reminder, but hey, this last thing before yeah, I let you go. Buddy. And I'm gonna talk uh, some really free good. I'm going to talk some Preakness. I got a, a, a buddy of mine, Craig Spencer, used to ride horses. This guy got formulas, man, that would blow your mind. And I, I want him yeah. to give me the winner tomorrow for the Preakness. But before you go, your favorite – you said you're a movie guy, right? Give me a top three Wesley yeah. Walker movies before you leave. Top three. Oh, my Wesley God. Walker, Walker. That, that is so hard because there's so many. I'm watching Just a, throw some out there. Throw I'm watching out a Clint Eastwood Unforgiven right now. But, oh, I – Denzel Washington made this movie, The Equalizer. I love this movie. Uh, Jaws was one of the, my favorites. I, I could just go on and on. It, there's so many. I, I can't even. And I like so many different. I love Robert De Niro. I love Clint Eastwood. I love uh, Liam Neeson, who I met at the Jet Game. Denzel Washington. I mean, there's just so many. I can go on. There's no favorite, favorite. I could watch. My, my girl thinks I'm crazy because I'll sit there and watch the same movie that I've seen over the years, but there's so many of them, but I just don't have this one favorite favorite. But uh, this movie with Denzel Watts, The Equalizer, I love, you know. I could watch yeah, I it over that. and over, but I could watch everything over and over. You know? See, my kids are young, right? I love movies. Well, I just watched my a new kids... King Kong movie I had before I called you. Pretty good, right? You like it? I thought it was pretty good. Loved no? it. Lo- loved it. I loved all the King Kong movies. Ah, uh, but somebody Black turned me off. Back in the day. Nah, they turned me off, uh, man. I, love I don't know. I don't know I why. My kids, uh, my yeah. kids, seven, 17, I got a 15, uh, 16 and 9, and they love Adam Sandler. So I get stuck watching, uh, which is good, all Adam hey, Sandler Hey, man. Uh, what's that one? Laughing, uh, laughing. Uh, the grown ups Africa? The no, they went to Africa on the trip with the, the girl with, uh, with the girl from the Titanic. Oh, I don't know. I didn't see that one. Am I that bad? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Then I can't even think it. Oh, I have it in my head right now. And they do the ah. thing called, and this, this guy, Terry, the buff black dude, uh, Terry something. Adam Sandler's in it. He, he, uh, I got I gotta, I gotta to check it out. I can't her name from Titanic. Yeah. I don't know. I'm oh, not a movie God. guy, so. It's so... I'm a movie guy, and I but I can't even remember this. Like my memory is shot. Oh, and oh. it's at the tip of my tongue right now, and it's really all right. Funny. You know what? You spend it on Facebook. You send it on Facebook. Like, yeah, that's what it is. Hey. But <laughs> in my eyes, in my eyes, they call they call guys now. I don't know. This is the new terminology. Goat. In my eyes, you were a goat. You know what I'm saying? You know you know the terminology, right? You you were the goat. What's that? Great, greatest of well, all I time. My yeah, eyes. I, 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 I appreciate that. Hey, well, I used to drop balls. I think of that is Muhammad Ali. You know, when you think of that. Yeah. Like, when he busted hey, up. In my mind, I was the greatest of all time, too. You know. Oh, no, no. It's, my, my, Craig is saying, he's saying it's Drew Barrymore. He thinks it is um, Drew African Barry- and black. Yeah. Not Titanic, but okay. Thank you. There yeah. You Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, you're right. It was Drew Barry. What was the name of it? And you know, the ti- well, that was the Titanic. I love Titanic. I like the 50. I, I like the 50 dates. Her. I like the fifty dates. That's but what I like. But, yeah, but but wouldn't she? Who was in Titanic? Wouldn't she? I don't know. Let's throw Craig. Let's throw Craig on real quick. Let's throw him on. He's waiting right here. Like, uh, Wait, yeah, Craig's gonna help the, us get out. Get the name of the movie. Get the I name don't know. of the movie though. Blended. Craig's, well, well, okay, blended. Craig's on. Blended. 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 That? That, that's what blended. it is. Blended. Blended. Yes, I could not think yeah. of it. You're right. Thank you, Craig Spencer. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, man. Hold on one second, brother. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Hey, I know brother. the movies, but I made their name. In music, I'm the same way. I don't know 
I I know music, but I don't know the names. That's that's all good, man. Thank you so much for joining yeah. me. Listen, if we could do this again, any other players out there that want to talk, you know, any of your buddies, man, hook me up, man. I got Chris Dishman coming All right, on. I try to do my best. A lot of them don't like talking, but I just talk too much. My girl I is like calling me right now. I didn't Find know I'd be on this long, you know. That's all right, but God, yeah. God bless you. And that's uh, Wesley Walker, New York Jets, man. Always 85. Not not Rob Moore, man. Not Rob okay. Moore. So, all I appreciate right? it. Thank right, you, Wesley Walker. Well, we'll all talk. Right, take care. All right. Thank we'll you very talk. much. All right. That's, you got it. Thank you. That, you're welcome. Thank you. That's uh, Wesley Walker. I got to take a 